The subject of scientific miracles in the Qur'an wasn't one I wanted to address again because their flaws have been evident for some time and many Muslims distance themselves from them. Unfortunately, they are still presented to non-Muslims at Dawa bookstalls. This was brought home to me recently when I shared a taxi with a young English couple who had recently converted to Islam. The first reason they gave was scientific miracles. So I've decided to address this issue one last time. There are three minimum requirements that must be met for such a claim to be proven. Number one, the knowledge didn't exist. Number two, there's no possible alternative meaning. And number three, statements are scientifically accurate. Not a single claim meets these criteria. Let's take a quick look at some of the main ones. Embryology. The Quran makes references to the development of a fetus. However, the ancient Greeks, as well as others, described this in similar terms long before Islam. For example, compare these Quranic statements to those of Galen 500 years before Muhammad. By the way, regarding the latter verse, flesh and cartilage form simultaneously. This was pointed out to Adnan Rashid when he cornered PC Myers outside a conference in Dublin. Adnan immediately responded with, Thumma can also mean simultaneously. The bones come first and then the flesh and the muscles. Is that what the Quran specifically says? Absolutely. Bones? This is exactly then, what the Quran says. Chapter, then, then chapter 23. Because you just demonstrated the Quran is wrong. Yeah, but how? Because how that's, is not, wrong? That's, what hap that's not what happens in the Well, world. this is what the embryologists are telling us. The this is exactly no, what the embryologists are telling us. No, they're not. I mean, okay. Embryologists... L let me tell you what Keith Moore said. I mean, you can disagree with him. He doesn't like Keith Moore. Uh, I, I don't know why, why you don't like... What he said on the page number 364A of his book, The Human Embryo, that in the seventh week the bones are formed and immediately after that <laughs> the flesh is formed and the flesh the, the bones are clothed with flesh. Well, Keith Moore is wrong. He's, he's an embryologist. Wrong. This is this is his field. It's my field too. I okay. know he's wrong. You're, you're an embry embryologist? The, the, yes. Oh, great. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's news to me. Okay. So that's uh, that, that's wrong because what happens first is you have you have differentiation of mesoderm. Right that within the mesoderm you have segregation into things like embryonic mesenchyme and then you have these cartilaginous centers that will form bone right and these are forming simultaneously with each other right simultaneously so you, so yes e even if that's the case the Quran is right because Thumma Thumma yeah. is very, very very even if that's the case even if that's the case linguistically the Quran is right Thumma literally can in Arabic language means uh, things happening simultaneously yes well. yes as for accuracy and alternative interpretations, look at the following verse. Let man consider from what he is created. He is created from gushing fluid that issues from between the backbone and ribs. If the fluid is semen, then this is inaccurate. Man is not created from semen. Semen is the vehicle sperm is carried. Conception occurs when a sperm penetrates the ovum, the female egg. The Quran never mentions the female egg. And for anyone claiming miraculous scientific foreknowledge, that is an inexcusable omission. The verse does, however, resemble the ancient belief that conception is caused by male and female fluids from all parts of the body. And that's what some classical tafsirs said. For example, Al-Qurtubi says, The fluid is semen. It comes down from the brain and passes between the backbone and ribs. Qatada said, It means the backbone of the man and the ribs of the woman while Al-Hasan said it means the backbone and ribs of the man and the backbone and ribs of the woman. For as we know, the nutfa comes from all parts of the body. The problems with this verse have led to some creative apologetics. One is that the word sulb is a euphemism for an erect penis and taraib is a euphemism for the vagina. Another is that the words issues from actually refer to a baby coming out of the womb. Yet another says it means man is born from the loins of the male and fed by the breast of the female. The irony is that the more attempts at rescuing this verse, the deeper the hole they are digging for it. The Big Bang. Do they not see the heavens and the earth were one entity and we separated them? Heaven being separated from earth is a very old idea and many creation myths mention it. The Sumerian Song of Ho said... Did he hasten to separate heaven from earth, and hasten to separate earth from heaven? The Babylonian myth of Enuma Elish says, 
when the heavens had been separated from the earth. In the Chinese creation myth, Pangu separated earth from sky, pushing the sky upward. In ancient Egyptian mythology, Jeb representing earth and Nut representing heaven were separated on the orders of the god Ra. It should be mentioned that under no circumstances can the Big Bang be described as separating heaven from earth. The Big Bang wasn't an explosion of matter, it was an expansion of space. At no point was the earth separated from anything. On the contrary, earth came together from debris nine billion years after the initial expansion. Life from water. We made from water every living thing. The claim is that the Quran confirms life originated in seas and lakes. However, again, this idea predates the Quran. The book of Genesis echoes the creation myths previously mentioned, and then says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth. The ancient Greek philosopher Thales said water was the nature of all things, and Anaximander put forward the astonishingly far-sighted view that life started from warm water and earth and emerged from fish-like creatures from the sea. Iron from the sky. We sent down iron. The claim is that no one could have known meteors contained iron from space. Just a quick search would reveal that this is untrue. Many cultures knew that meteors contained iron. For example, 3,000 years before Islam, the ancient Egyptians called iron the metal of heaven. Perhaps more importantly, most of the iron we use doesn't come from space, but from underground. It should also be noted that Anzala often simply means God gave it to them. For example, the Quran also says, O children of Adam, we sent down clothing for you. Expanding Universe the claim is that the Qur'an reveals the universe is continually expanding because the word Musa is an active participle and so can give the meaning of an ongoing act. However, that was not how the word was understood by traditional scholars. Classical tafsirs say it means dhu si'a, possessing abundant ability, and inna la musi'un is similar to inna la qadirun, verily we are well able. This is supported by the fact that in the only other instance of the word Musa, it says, al Musa qadarahu, the one with abundant means according to his capability. For this reason, the tafsirs make this the preferred meaning. However, some also say it can mean to make a vast and wide expanse, which is something any human looking at the sky can observe. Muslims are obviously free to believe it describes the scientific theory of a continually expanding universe, but they cannot present it as a proven scientific miracle when there are alternative and more attested meanings available. It should also be pointed out that the model of a continually expanding universe is certainly the popular current model. But unlike religion, science can change when new information comes along. And so handcuffing Islam to current scientific theories is a risky business. Mountains and earthquakes. We set on the earth mountains standing firm lest it should shake with them. There are a few variations of this claim. In fact, it's difficult keeping up with how these miracle claims move the goalposts, as critics point out flaws. However, I will focus on the main one, namely that it has only recently been discovered that mountains reduce earthquakes. Ancient cosmological myths depicted mountains as both holding up the heavens and keeping the earth firm. For example, in Canaanite mythology, there were twin mountains, Tarogazizi and Tharumagi, which held up the firmament and bound the earth together. The Old Testament describes mountains as pillars of the earth and says, I set firm its pillars. And for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. But what really undermines this miracle claim is that the verse doesn't say mountains reduce the effect of earthquakes. It says, lest it should shake with them. Tabari in his tafsir says, so that it doesn't overturn on people, so they can live securely on its surface. Earthquakes kill more people than any other type of natural disaster put together. 
In the 20-year period between 1994 and 2013, three quarters of a million men, women and children were killed by earthquakes. And they occur on the very fault lines where mountains exist. Mountains don't solve the problem. They are a byproduct of the problem. They are formed by tectonic plates colliding. Mountains are not firm nor immovable, even though that's how they appear to us. Their very existence is as a result of continuous movement over long periods of time. Those who make this miracle claim need to step back and think about what they are actually saying, namely, that God chose to create a deadly environment that shakes, then placed mountains to reduce it. Why make it shake in the first place? And are the millions of deaths from earthquakes much of an improvement? Mountain Roots Related to this claim is that the Qur'an discovered mountains have roots. However, there were people in the past who held similar beliefs. Aristotle referred to those who believed the earth had roots, and the Old Testament refers to roots of mountains. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of mountains. To the roots of mountains I sank down. Universe from Smoke then he turned to the heavens when it was smoke. Dukhan means smoke or vapour. Ibn Kathir in his tafsir says, Thumma stawa ala sama'i wa hiya dukhan, wa huwa bukhar al ma Then he turned to the heavens when it was dukhan, which is water vapour. The miracle claim is that the Qur'an reveals the gaseous state of the early universe, or cosmic dust, both of which, can be argued, resemble smoke or vapour. Again, if Muslims today want to interpret this to be a metaphor for the gaseous state of the universe, they are free to do so. But they cannot claim it is a scientific miracle without precise language to support it, nor can they do so when there are alternative meanings possible. The verse could just as easily echo the creation story in Genesis, which describes the heavens as water, which biblical commentators say means water vapour, precisely how classical tafsirs described it. Interestingly, some Christian creationists regard the Bible's reference to a vapour canopy in Genesis to be a scientific miracle. However, neither the description of the heavens as smoke or water vapour accurately reflect modern theories about the early universe. But even more problematic is that the Qur'an describes the earth as being formed first. Then God turned to the heavens, which were in this state of Dukhan, but the universe was no longer in a gaseous state of the early universe by the time the Earth was formed, nine billion years later. So this doesn't match any scientific model of the early universe. It should also be pointed out that this same passage describes the creation of the Earth in four days and the heavens in two days, which implies the Earth took longer to form than the entire universe. If those who claim miracles had the courage of their convictions they should proclaim that the Earth took longer to form than the universe, in opposition to modern scientific theories, rather than confining themselves to retrofitting verses after science already made a discovery. Pharaoh's body. We will this day deliver you with your body that you may be a sign to those after you. The claim is that the Quran says Pharaoh's body would be preserved for later generations to see. Classical tafsirs, however, say this means God commanded the sea to throw out his body as a sign for the Bani Israel at the time, because some of them doubted he was dead. They say it is Pharaoh's story that is a lesson for those who come after, just as other past events described in the Quran are signs for people who come after. But for argument's sake, I'll accept it means his body will be preserved for everyone in the future to see. However, since it was already known that the bodies of pharaohs were preserved through mummification, there's nothing miraculous about this. Some Muslims identify the pharaoh of Moses as Ramesses II, while others as Merneptah. In either case, it doesn't matter because they were both preserved through the usual mummification process. And the presence of salt in the bodies doesn't prove they drowned at sea because salt was one of the ingredients of the mummification process. A myth that still circulates to this day is that the body of Pharaoh was found by the Red Sea. 
This is untrue. Ramesses II and Merneptah were both buried in the Valley of the Kings, and like many other pharaohs, their bodies were moved to the nearby royal cache due to grave robbing, and this is where they were discovered in 1881 and 1898, respectively. Fresh and salt water not mixing. Fresh and salt water do mix. However, in an estuary, they don't mix straight away because fresh water is less dense and floats on top of the heavier seawater that sinks down. This is something humans can observe without divine help and was known about before Islam. For example, Aristotle says the drinkable sweet water then is light and all of it is drawn up. The salt water is heavy and remains behind. Seven layers of the atmosphere. The Quran discovered the seven layers of the atmosphere. The seven heavens cannot mean the earth's atmosphere, not least because the Quran says the stars are in the lowest heaven. If stars were in our atmosphere, we would be in serious trouble. By the way, it's interesting how inconsistent these claims are with how they interpret words. For example, they interpret a samawat as the whole universe for the Big Bang claim, but then as just sky or atmosphere for this claim. I could go on about these miracle claims because there are so many, with new ones popping up or morphing as flaws are pointed out, but then this video would go on forever. The practice of using scientific discoveries to prove the Qur'an is a recent phenomenon, and the great Muslim scientists of the Islamic Golden Age who themselves made some amazing discoveries never made such claims about the Qur'an. In part, it can be traced back to 1975 in a book called The Bible, the Qur'an and Science by Maurice Bukhar, a physician to King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. It has led to a phenomenon that many refer to as Bukhailism. In 1984, the Saudi Muslim World League set up the Commission on Scientific Signs in the Qur'an and Sunnah, with Sheikh Abdul Majid as Zindani at its head. It organized several international conferences where scientists from various fields were invited ostensibly to help the spread of science in Muslim countries. However, many of these scientists found themselves being presented with quotes from the Qur'an and asked to comment. They had to rely on their hosts' promises to be completely neutral, but their responses were then edited and used in dawa videos and publications. The Commission set in motion a trend that has dominated the popular imagination of Muslims ever since. But it was a very dishonest and misleading process, and one that many of these scientists have since distanced themselves from. For example, William Hay complained of having fallen into a trap of interviews, while the embryologist Gerald Geringer complained of manipulation. Geologist Professor Alfred Kerner has a standard email reply clarifying his out-of-context remarks that were used by Muslim apologists. Even Keith Moore, constantly quoted by apologists regarding embryology, lacked enough conviction in the miracle claims promoted by Zindani to omit them from his book, The Developing Human, apart from as footnotes in a special edition subtitled With Islamic Additions for sale in Islamic countries. There are several interviews with some of these scientists conducted by The Rationalizer available on his YouTube channel.